In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 10, you have this statement in which Paul is summing up the life of Israel that he's begun speaking of in the first part, verse 1. And he's talking about how Israel behaved, the attitudes they had, and their attitude toward God. And he comes down then, right before he says, all these are an example to us. And says, nor complained, as some of them also complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Nor complained, as some of them complained, and were destroyed by the destroyer. As I begin, if you'd like to turn back to Exodus chapter 15, we'll be there in just a moment. Both Old and New Testaments use the word complain. That word is the word for murmur. When you look in a Bible dictionary and you look up the word murmur, it talks about complaining. When you look in Young's Concordance and you look under the word murmur, under that it will give the verses that talk about complaining. So when you hear the word complain, it's more than just griping. It's the word murmur. That word murmur is an interesting word. In fact, say that ten times real quick. And you get the idea of the word. The idea of a murmur and murmuring is, it's sort of a slow guttural sound that just becomes with its expression over and over and over again destructive the best way I know to describe that for us is have you ever been in a room where the noise was not just really loud but there was just kind of this whispering kind of inaudible expression of stuff that was going on and you had people over here talking and people over here talking and people over here talking well that's what murmuring sounds like it's just kind of a guttural whispering that takes place and the Hebrew word also carries with it the idea of slander so it's not just people visiting and talking in this low, low roar or low, low, low whisper, there's also, there's also something destructive or slanderous that's taking place with that word. Israel became tremendously proficient at murmuring. Someone said of murmuring slash complaining, it's like bad breath. Everybody knows it, notices it except for the person who has it. Everybody else notices the murmuring, but the person or persons that are involved in it. Throughout the history, Israel's fatigue, their anxiety, their stress, their fear of the unknown, their their yearning for the past, <laughs> their fear of the future seemed to always overwhelm them. And it was also not just the fear of the unknown. It was the yearning for the past and maybe even the here and the now. You know, we think about Esau. And we, we, we think about how Esau was standing before Jacob and made that deal with the, bowl of, with the bowl of beans. Ricky's translation. And say, give, give me that, I'm going to die. 
nobody dies from having missed a meal over 24 hours. He wasn't going to die. But he thought he had to have that for his immediate gratification. And lost what was exponentially of greater value. Because he could not see past the point of his nose. Now I brought Esau up for this. Esau's not in the boat by himself. And I'm not talking about people in the world. Esau's not in a boat by himself with people who profess to be Bible-believing Christians. In fact, none of us, none of us, self-included, are exempt from doing that. We all are moved with what is at the point of our nose. Or... In our recent past, or what is going not our way, my way, in the here and the now. And so in this list of things that Paul brings out in 1 Corinthians 10, none of which have a compliment to it. He speaks about their murmuring and how the destroyer destroyed them over it. I think it's something we need to pay attention to. Significantly so. And so what I want to do with you this morning is I just want to look at some Old Testament, New Testament passages that talk about how this took place, what's taking place, when it takes place. And this connects a little bit with the end of Jordan's sermon, with what he said in Psalm chapter 95, and how that their complaining grieved God. There's a New Testament passage that says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Well, deity was grieved because of this. And he attributed it to the hardness of their hearts, as Jordan brought out. But the very first passage I want you to look at with me is found in Exodus chapter 15. And Cameron alluded to this just a moment ago. I want to set the stage for you in each of these scenes and then move to the passage and see what takes place. You're familiar with what, what, what has taken place just prior to chapter 15. For 430 years or thereabout, Israel has been in Egyptian bondage. They have been under the greatest duress, even though for a predominance of the time, there was a Pharaoh that was friendly to the God of Jacob, I'm sorry, of Joseph. But now there has arisen a God that did not know the God of Joseph, and he's become a brute, and that is an understatement. He despises the God of Joseph, and despises the children of Israel. So much so that he wanted to have all the baby boys of a certain age put to death with the hope that what he would do is put to death the one that was going to be the deliverer and wound up being an adopted father to him after it was all said and done. Well, after the ten plagues, in which Pharaoh finally learns who the Lord is and that he's not as great as the Lord, he relents and says, you can go. Get out of here. Take everything you want to take with you. Get out now. And they came out a great people and a wealthy people, which is just what God told Abraham was going to happen. They just crossed the Red Sea. They've just seen the armies of Pharaoh drown and be destroyed. Here is the greatest power on the earth that day destroyed. And Miriam writes this song in chapter 15. It is a song of praise, a psalm of power, a psalm of great deliverance, a psalm of great reflection of all that God has just done for them. 
I mean, it is, they can still smell, as it were, the deliverance there. It is that fresh for them. And so it comes to verse 22. It says, so Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. For they called the name of it. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Now again, just remember. They've just seen the mighty hand of God perform this awesome feat. They've been in bondage for 430 years. Generations have been born there. Generations have died there. Joseph said, don't leave my bones there. Carry them with you. And they said they would, and they did for 40 years. You talk about being careful of making a promise. And the first thing they do right out of the box is they begin to complain. But notice how it is worded. He said, and the people complained against Moses. Put a peg there. That will become a repeated refrain we need to, renote, we need to note. What did God do? God made the waters come and made the water sweet. God provided for their needs. The point is, even in the face of great deliverance and great manifestation of God, people still murmured. Turn to chapter 16. Chapter 16. And notice verse 1, and notice the timeline here. And they journeyed from Elam, and the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. Did you notice that? They're in the second month of having departed. Time is measured from the time they departed. In the second month, just in the second month, and the 15th day, if there's 30 days in their months, they're halfway through the second month. It's a month and a half. If their calendar is 30 days. A month and a half out they are. And it says, verse 2, the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Put a peg there. And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord of the land of Egypt. Time out. Pause. Wait a minute. Early in Exodus it says, the Lord said he heard their cry. What are they crying about? Get us out of here. We're being treated like trash here. We've had what we need to make these bricks reduced, and now we're having to do it just by sheer ingenuity. Get us out of here. They're crying to the Lord. Deliver us. And it says, the Lord heard their cry. And now it says, a month and a half out. They said, oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt. How short our memories are. Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we saw it, when we sat by the pots of meat, when we ate the bread to the full, for you brought us out of this wilderness to kill this whole assembly uh, with this hunger. They didn't have the pots that were full. They didn't have the pots filled with meat. Ricky's translation. They may have at best have boiling water with a cut up onion in it. That's what they've got. They didn't have a fatty calf. Sitting on the spigot, turning around over a roasted, open, open, open fire. Those people, you talk about root hog and die poor, they're just root hog. Die poor would have been a compliment to them. And this is how they remember it. They're not alone in remembering the past more fondly than is the present and the future. Do we do that? 
We glory in the past. And the past is never as painful as it was in the present as when it was going on. But continue. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven, and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they will keep my law. Verse 6, And Moses, said, Moses and Aaron said to the children of Israel, At evening you shall know the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. Duh! Did you not know he did it when he delivered you with the Egyptians here? Do you see this human story taking place? And also Moses said, This shall be seen when the Lord gives you meat in the evening and the morning bread to the full, for the Lord heard your complaint which you make against him. And what are we? You, your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Who is the focal point of the complaint? Moses and Aaron. But who is really the focal point of the complaint? God. Question. Is God tangible? Can you taste him? Can you smell him? Can you touch him? Can you hear him? No. Who can you taste, touch, smell, and hear? Moses and Aaron. So you have Exodus chapter 16, in which you have the text taking place. Turn again now to Numbers chapter 11. There's some complaint that takes place in chapter 17, but we're going to turn to Numbers chapter 11. Scene switches. Just prior to chapter 11, you have that they've been camped for three days. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter 1, it says... They were eight days' journey from the promised land. But it takes them, if you do all the timeline, over 51 days to get there for a number of reasons. And this is one of the reasons. They've just been stalled. They've just been stalled for about three days. You, you go back to, to verse 31 in chapter 10. So Moses said, Please do not leave inasmuch as you know how we are to camp in the wilderness, and you can be our eyes, and it shall be that we'll go with you indeed. That whatever God, the Lord, will do to us, the same will do to you. So they departed from the mountain on a journey on three days. And they then come to the Lord and went before for three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. So they've been waiting for three days for a resting place. They move. And you come to verse 1 of chapter 11. Now when the Lord, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. For the Lord heard it and his anger was aroused against them. And the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. This more than any gives, this is our first look. How does God regard this? Notice here it clearly, clearly says, the people complained against the Lord here. Moses gets a break this time. They complained against the Lord. And, and what did God do? He caused the fire to come out and consume some on the outskirts. But the Lord's also gracious and merciful. So he said, the people cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire was quenched. If you had been Moses, and they've been fussing against you, it, that's just a little bit, it's going to get worse for them. It doesn't know it yet, but it's going to be. Would you have been the one that said, okay, Lord, please, please quench the fire? Or would you sit back and say, yes, yes, you got what you, I am sick and tired of hearing you. Do you see what this does? But do you remember how Moses is described in the Bible? The meekest of men. And this is his meekness. Well, what does the Lord do? He said, now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to the intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlics. Notice there's no cow meat there. Now it's just fish meat, and that may be a little exaggeration. But now our whole being is dried up, and there's nothing except the, nothing except the manna before our eyes. 
And so, the mantle was like coriander seed, and its color like the color of bedellum. And the people went out and gathered the ground of millstones, or beat it in the mortar, and cooked it in pans, and made cakes of it. And the taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. So what's going to do? God going to do? They complain about being hungry, and God gives them manna to eat. So we turn next to Numbers chapter 14. Now just prior to chapter 14, you are familiar with the fact that what has taken place here is now they've come up to the river's edge. Over 51 days to get there. They're right before the river. And Moses tends, sends out 10 spies, or, or 12 spies, one representing each tribe. And they go and they spy out the land, and everything they see about the land is true, everything they say about the land is true. It is a land flowing of milk and honey. It is a land where there are giants. The walls are great. And there's something about the land that would devour the people. And they come back and they tell the people that. In fact, they even bring evidence of how great the land is. It takes multiple men to carry it. So they're not just coming back telling a fantasy here. They're coming back representing what's going on here. And they come back and they say, listen, we're not able to do this. And so in verse 1 of chapter 14 it says, So all the congregation of the people, so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained, murmured against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. You know, if they had just numbered their complaints, one, two, three, four, we could have said number two, and cut short the whole thing because it's the same thing all over again. Only if we had died, only if we had died, only if we have died. Talk about a broken record in a one track mind. And so it says in verse 3, Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to be victims, uh, to return to Egypt? Again, longing for the past, exaggerating what's taken place, not content with what God's provided for them at this point. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation of Israel, why? Because in verse 4, they said, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Now it comes out. I've had you set two pegs so far on Moses and Aaron. Now it comes out. They don't like the leaders. Moses and Aaron are God's representatives. Moses and Aaron have delegated authority from God. And here are the people who are speaking against God's delegated authority in Moses and Aaron. And Moses and Aaron just fall on their faces because the people say, we want better leaders. Put a peg on leaders. We'll come to that in just a moment. So what happens in verse 9? The appeal is, only do not rebel against the Lord nor fear the people of the land. For they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said, stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the meeting before all the children of Israel. What was the response when they said, look, these people, they're bread. They're in our hands. They're putting our hands. And what did the people want to do? They wanted to stone them. Stone them. And so verse 11, it says, that the Lord said to Moses, how long? Will these people reject me? Wait a minute. I thought you were upset with Moses and Aaron. And now even the Lord is exasperated over it. Now even the Lord is ready to throw his hands up and say, I'm done. I'm done with these people. But who stands up and appeals? Moses said, no, time out, Lord. Time out. Whoa, let's back, up, back it up here. You can't do that. You can't bring these people out here to kill them because then all the people are going to say, that's what you intended to do all along. And now all their cries are going to be true. But no, Lord, wait, back up here. And that had to be an interesting conversation on its own. 
But turn to chapter 16. Turn to chapter 16. And now we find who the leaders are in some of this. So, so Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliath, and on the son of Palath, the sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses. And some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. Now the, the men that rise up, these aren't nobodies. These are men everybody knows. And now it's not just Dathan, Abiram, and on. Now they have influenced 250 people in the congregation to rise up with them. And so, what's their complaint? They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said, Then you take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among, among us, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and spoke to Korah and all the people of the company and said, tomorrow we're going to find out who the leaders are. God's going to let us know. And he tells them how that's going to take place. Now they're not complaining about the food. Now they're not complaining about the water. Now they're not complaining about how long they've been in the desert. Now it comes out, what they're really upset about is, they're upset about Moses and Aaron being in the place they're in. And said, look, you guys... This has gone to your head, and we're sick and tired of you. We want new leaders. You take too much on yourself. You have exerted too much of yourself upon other people. So, you turn to verse 11. It says, therefore, you and all your company are gathered together, notice, against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you should complain against him? They were complaining against Moses and Aaron. They're murmuring against God. And then verse 12 says, Moses sent, sent, Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come. Basically is, you're not telling us what to do. No, we're not coming. You're not telling us what to do. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? You're not telling us what to do. God didn't die and make you God. Who made you a prince? No, we're not doing it. We're not coming. We're going to do what we want to do. Then it says, verse 14, Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us an inheritance of the fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. We know why you want us to come up. And so then it says, Then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have taken one donkey from them, nor I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and all your company present before the Lord. You shall be there, and you're going to find out who the leaders are. And guess what? They found out. Because when you come to verse 29, it says, If these men die naturally then all, like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But the Lord creates a new thing and opens its mouth that swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit. Then they will understand that these men have rejected the Lord now it came to pass, as he finished speaking all these words, the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah and all their goods. I guess we found out who the leader was. The earth opens up and swallows them and all their household. Would you not think that after that, the people would say, listen, we got to zip it. <laughs> this complaining about what God's given us, this complaining about Moses and Aaron, this complaining about not having enough, 
this complaining about the water, this complaining about the, the flesh pots of Egypt that were really not flesh pots, that were not so great, and Egypt was not so great. We, we got to zip it. Look at, where this, look at what da- happened to Dathan and Abiram and all those that were with them. Earth opened up and swallowed them. Great. End of story. What a nice ending. Finally, the people get it. But verse 41 says, On the next day, all the congregation of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron and said, You have killed the people of the Lord. And it says, verse 49, Now those who died in the plague that were sent because of that were 14,700 beside those who died with Korah. 14,700, the 250 men, Korah and all their family, die because of their murmuring and their complaining against the Lord. God had provided everything for them. Given them men to lead them who cared deeply for them. Who were sacrificing personally for them. All they can do is exaggerate their circumstances. They can't stop for one minute and seem to appreciate all that God is doing and all that Moses and Aaron. And the fact is, he said, and make it me, not Aaron. Aaron's here because I made an excuse to God to begin with. Isn't it interesting? Moses does a lot of talking after he says he can't talk. Aaron's here because of me to begin with. And why are you doing this with Aaron? But they complain against God. And then we come to Numbers chapter 17. In verse 5, it says, It it shall be that the rod, the man whom I choose, will blossom, and I will rid myself of the complaints of the children of Israel, which they have made against you. And in verse 20, he says, uh, if you turn to verse 20 in chapter 17, you're going to be uh, not going to be there. That was a typo on my part. So it then says in verse 9, Then Moses brought all the rods before the Lord to all the children of Israel, and they looked, and each man took his rod, and the Lord said to Moses, being, bring Aaron's rod back before the testimony to be kept, a sign against the rebels, that you may put their complaints from me. Moses, bring your rods. I'm going to be done with the complaints. Now, I want you to just pause for a moment before we go to the New Testament and look at a couple of things. I want you to just pause a moment. I put the passages up there like that because I want you to see the passages. I want you to see the weight of those passages. This is not a topical lesson that, that came simply from the mind of Ricky. We've simply opened the Bible and we've looked at the passages, what's taking place in the passages, and what the complaint was, and who the complaint was against, and what they had to complain about. I want to ask you something. Did they really have anything to complain about? Did God ever leave them alone? Were Moses and Aaron inept? Fell in their responsibility? Did God ever fail them? Not once. But all you see running through that story is murmuring after murmuring after murmuring after murmuring. People who do it, people who influence others to do it, and people who lead others to do it, And others follow the murmuring and the complaining. The people that took took it on the nose were Moses and Aaron. God's delegated delegated, delegated representatives. And God repeatedly says, it's against me. Not you. But Moses and Aaron took it personal. They influenced others to do the very same thing that they were doing, those who were leading the complaint. Murmuring never takes place in a vacuum. It never takes place in a vacuum. And someone will always be influenced by it. But I just want to look at a couple of New Testament passages real quickly with you, and then make a couple of observations, and then then we'll bring it to a close. Turn first of all to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. 
in verse 11. This is the parable in which the men are paid early in the day a penny for their wages, and those that come in later in the day are paid a penny for their wages. And so verse 11 says, And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner. Why? Because they put in more time working that day than the people who came in later in the day. And they thought since they had put in more time in the day, they should receive more bounty because of the time they put in, as opposed to everybody early or late being paid the same. Now, the parable is not about how much money they received. The parable is about this. You can come early to the kingdom, you can come late to the kingdom, but the reward is the same. Who are we to complain? Who is it to complain that here someone comes to the kingdom and they die the next day and here's someone that's come to the kingdom and they serve the Lord for 70 years they get the same reward? I know many of you won't remember the name Nettie Becker. And you may not remember the name Gladys Fight. Years ago, Gladys Fight was a member here. Gladys lived in South Dallas in an apartment complex that Nettie Becker owned. And Nettie Becker never raised her rent after all the years that Nettie, that she let Gladys live in her apartments. Several of you went down south to pick up Gladys. You got to hear the stories about her life growing up and everything. Well, Gladys worked and worked and worked and worked on Nettie. Finally, Gladys had cancer and she's going to have very, very serious surgery. And she told several of us, don't, don't, don't drop Nettie, don't drop Nettie, study with Nettie. Well, Pretty soon after Gladys came out of surgery, Nettie obeyed the gospel. She was afraid of water. Well, that's kind of key to baptism. It was either two or three weeks later, I get a call from Joe. He said, Ricky, Nettie went to the grocery store today and slumped over her wheel and she died. She'd been a Christian three weeks. How long have you been serving the Lord? Now, are you going to complain against God when you get there that Nettie gets the same thing you got? That's what happened in verse 11. They're complaining about that. Then look real quickly to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. And look at verse 2. The tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. They're murmuring because he's eating with sinners. Here's the one who came to seek and save the lost, and they're murmuring because he's eating with sinners. The only thing these Pharisees can do is murmur because he's eating with sinners. You get that? He's eating with sinners, and the Pharisees are fussing about it. They're murmuring about it. You just see a pocket of them over here. They're just chewing him up, having him for dinner. They're just murmuring about it over here. Do you see that? He's eating with sinners. He's eating with sinners. Oh, no. Stop the earth. They're complaining because he's going to, oh, Try to save somebody. But the righteous don't need a physician, right? And they were sicker than they thought. And then turn to Philippians chapter 2. Our last passage we'll note this morning. I'm going to skip John 6. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. John 6 is about the bread. They're fussing about the bread because they want more bread and they're not happy with the bread Jesus gave them, and that's the short of John 6. So in Philippians chapter 2, look at what Paul will say in verses 14 and 15. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Paul writes to these saints at Philippi, and he says, You saints in Philippi, listen, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless, harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked, perverse generation in this world. What he's saying is, if you want your light to shine, 
if you want your light to shine, don't gripe and complain. Don't complain and don't argue. If you want your light to shine. Because our light's not going to shine when all we do is complain and argue. Now I want to, I want to walk back through all this and, and kind of tie this together real, real quickly with you. Notice, in all of this, this murmuring and complaint denied the goodness of God. It denied the blessings that God had given. In Philippians, it disrupts the oneness of the people. Because it always exaggerates the problem and contaminates others. It's almost like throughout the Bible that what we're missing is we're missing an event in the Olympic Games. I'm just waiting for somebody to say I got the silver medal in the Olympics in the whining competition. Because that's what's missing. Israel got the gold medal. They made wrong decisions and led wrong directions because they had wrong conclusions. And it disrupted the oneness of God's people and destroyed them. It dissolves the unity. Look at what Paul will say following in verses 16 through 17. Holding fast the word of faith that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and I'm being poured out as a drink offering of the sacrifice and service of your, service of your, service of your faith. I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Paul said, don't, don't, don't complain and dispute. It destroys joy in people. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 1, it's a reference on Numbers chapter 13 and 14. And there it says, because of unbelief, they did not enter. The murmuring was indicative of a fact of no faith or their lack of faith in God and their exaggeration of the moment. Now, let's bring this home for us because we've been talking about Israel, we've been talking about New Testament, New Testament stuff. Let's bring this home for us. Is it possible that in our homes, in our homes, we, we can have the greatest blessings in our homes? And all we do is fuss and complain about it because we don't have more or don't have what we think we ought to have? Is it possible that there's a father in the home that is God's delegated representative as head of the family? That he becomes the meal because he's the one chewed up? How did God feel about that when it was Dathan and Abiram and on and the 14,700? How did God feel about that? Is it possible in this local church that we have, have shepherds like Joe and Breck, James and Terry and Rick that have dedicated themselves to sacrificing their lives for the oversight and the shepherding of this flock and giving themselves for it that put a little salt and pepper on it, they become the Sunday dinner? How did God feel about that? God's delegated representatives in the church. Delegated authority. How did God feel about that? How did he feel about it with Dathan and Abiram and the 250 that were with them? How did he feel about that? Is it possible that we can have a congregation of people that is rich in talent and rich in resources? And the only thing that is for us to do is to get in our pockets and murmur about what we think is not right. How 
How did God feel about that? How did God feel about that? How did he feel about the nation of Israel when they did that? How did God feel about murmuring and complaining? I did, it's not my opinion. I, I didn't, I, this is not from the book of Ricky. I gave you the passages. It's straight out of the book. Now, we'll pay attention to he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We, if we try to sprinkle somebody, there's going to be an uproar. If we try to roll an ishput down the aisle, there's going to be an uproar. Well, why aren't those passages just as important as baptism and a cappella singing? Because it condemns some people. There's some people who lost their lives over it. So what can we do? This one in there, what can we do? First of all, because we're spending more time thinking about God, we can spend more time thanking God. It's going to be hard to be filled with disputing and complaining. What, what I'm doing is I'm thanking God and appreciating all that God has given. If, if Israel just stopped to say, get on their knees and say, God, thank you for delivering us. Egypt was a madhouse. We were abusive and we know we know we're a little thirsty here, we're a little hungry here, but God, we know you'll provide for us. And we've got this congregation of people that have such rich talents and rich opportunities that are before us. And what we do is we thank God because this is my church. As Jordan said a few weeks ago, this is my church. I'm proud of my church. Let me tell you about the good in my church. Let me tell you what so-and-so does that you may not know. Let me tell you what so-and-so does that you don't know. Let me tell you about my church. Is it possible we can spend more time filled thinking about people that are God's people in this church with gratitude rather than finding fault? Second, not only be filled with gratitude, But have a 40 day complaint fast. A 40 day complaint fast. Why did I say 40? I had to have a number. A 40 day complaint fast. I hate this Dallas traffic, but I have a car I get to drive in. The Church of Christ, they, but we have great local congregations. You can't trust those elders, but we've got great shepherds. The price of gas is, but we get to drive. For every complaint, every murmuring that's given, there's an anecdotal compliment. <coughs> there's an anecdotal compliment. Have a fast on complaining. And then finally, be filled with gratitude, have a fast on complaining. Open our eyes to the endless blessings and possibilities that lie before us. Address what needs to be addressed. You know what? Sometimes fathers and husbands are wrong. Sometimes fathers and husbands are not what they ought to be. And you know what? Sometimes elders are not, not what they ought to be. Sometimes elders are wrong. And you know what? Sometimes local churches are not, not what they ought to be. Sometimes local churches are wrong. We're not talking about uh, hiding the truth here. Speak the truth. Speak the truth. But come with a solution. Don't you speak the truth. Come with a solution. How do I know you care about me if you don't come to me? Me personally, but I'm speaking me generally here. How do I know you don't care about me if you don't come to me? How, when I hear the murmuring about this, this, and this, I think, do you really care or you would come? Well, he's just not approachable. Well, give it a shot. You may find there's more approachable than you thought. You may find there's more that you can identify with that person than you, than you ever imagined. Usually, we build a straw man that's bigger than what the straw man actually is. 
But when you come, don't just come poking a finger in the chest, telling what's wrong. Come with a solution. Speak the truth. Yes, sometimes, sometimes mistakes need to be addressed and poor judgment needs to be addressed. And that happens. It's a given. It happens. Nobody's immune to it. But don't get in the pockets and then murmur about it and then exaggerate it and then forget the goods that's there and then influence others to do the same thing. Because when we're doing that, it's not against the person we're doing it or persons. It's more serious. It's against God. It's against God. And the passage says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. And then finally I would say, that everything, that everything be filtered through 1 Corinthians 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Vaults not, is not puffed up. Is not selfish, does not behave rudely. Takes no offense at evil easily. Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And when we do that, everything will be successful because love never fails. The Holy Spirit said that. Everything has to be filtered through 1 Corinthians 13 and that love. Where are you this morning? Has your life been filled with a little bit too much of what we've been talking about? Then cleanse it. Go to your closet. And don't come out till you've prayed it all out before God. And then talk to somebody. Be a brother and talk to them. And help them. Help me. Be my brother. Help me. Help me serve the Lord better. If we can help you in some way, why don't you come while we stand and while we sing. Thank you for connecting with us this morning. We're so thankful that you were able to do that. If you have questions, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you. You can contact us at www.thebibleway.com or questions at thebibleway.com. Questions at thebibleway.com. We'd love to have you in person. Come if you can. But thank you for connecting with us.